Divine Truth Name of this presentation is The Loving Use of Mediumship and is part of the Spirit Relationship Series. It was presented in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia on the 12th of April 2012. This is Session 2, Part 2. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was the general uh, summary, I've mentioned the other bits, so that was the general summary of the self-righteousness area mm -hmm. that they wanted to mention to you. Is there any questions about that that you'd like to raise? Alexis? Um, yeah, for me, um, I, I feel I'm going through something challenging as far as um, when spirits or even people, when they get heavily into denial yeah. um, at a certain point, it starts to look absurd and comical to me. And I'm just wondering what emotion is... Now, what you're displaying that. right now is the arrogance that we're speaking of. Exactly, yeah. Because the reality is, yeah. you are one of the most... Per one of the persons that I feel are yeah. sometimes in complete denial yeah. of the real emotion. In fact, if I can point out one emotion, sure. you have some emotions of rage within you, yeah. which you are in complete denial of. Right. And so it's, it's in a way strange that you then have see the complete denial of another person with a different emotion yeah. and then feel like almost laughing at them. Right, yeah. So that would be yeah. the same as me saying to you, you're in complete denial of your rage and then making a joke about it or, or yeah. making you feel small about that denial. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. And this is where we've got to be careful, you see, because because quite often the very thing we're laughing at or the very thing that we see in the other person is the exact thing that's in us that we do not see. Mm -hmm. That's why we see it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Uh, so, yeah. so to resolve that issue emotionally, we can intellectually do that leap, mm -hmm. but to resolve that issue emotionally, we would, like for Alexis, it is actually the anger that causes him to feel detached and be able to laugh. Yeah. Yeah. So we would intellectually see that and we would recognise that emotionally as an error in love. Yeah. And then ask to open to that emotion within ourselves. Yes, but yeah. there's something you can do while you're in the group. You know, when you feel that within you, that feeling, oh, I just want to laugh at this person because it seems to me like yeah. they're just ridiculously yeah. in yeah. denial. Yeah. Right, when you feel that, then you go ask yourself, is this a loving feeling that I'm now projecting at this person? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously it's not. No, yeah, that's what right? I'm asking. So, yeah. so what we do then is we go, okay, I have to at least, in this interaction, own the fact that right now I am not being loving. Mm -hmm. Do you see? Yeah. And if you, in that moment, own the fact that you're not being loving, that the feeling that inside of you to want to laugh or to want to you know, make fun of them or whatever, is a not a loving feeling. In that moment, they will receive less projection from you. So, I'm sorry, say that again. I spaced that off. Right. <laughs> when you own the feeling, and this is when you space out, it's because you don't want to know yeah. how you can change in the moment. Right. You see, many of you, if I could just go general here now for a moment, many of you have so much anger in you that you desperately wish to not even know when you're how to actually respond to your anger, how to actually deal with your anger. Because it's righteous. Because the feeling yeah, that hold it's on righteous. To your righteousness, is it? Yeah. And can I just say as a side point as well, often when we address a specific question for someone, a lot of you tune out and most of the time it's completely relevant for everyone. For everyone. So just notice that. You yeah. Know, just to... yeah. So so let's go back to the, the situation. So let's say you notice so firstly, you have to be self-observant, don't you? Mm -hmm. You have to be humble enough to be self-observant. Okay, I'm, I'm now feeling like I want to laugh at him. Right, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I go, okay, now I feel like I want to laugh at them. Why do I want to laugh at them? Oh, it's because I think they're just absurdly in denial. Like, it's absurd. <laughs> and then I go, then I have to go, okay, firstly, my feelings of wanting to laugh at somebody else's denial is obviously out of harmony with love. Now, the, the moment you tell yourself that, you are automatically now being more self-reflective. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you are, there is less projection going at the spirit who you've now wanted to laugh at just previously. You right. understand? Yeah. Yeah. Then you would go, well, okay, 
I want to laugh at them, which is really like quite a belittling, sarcastic thing to do. Mm. And sarcasm and belittling another person is based upon, usually upon anger about something that they're <laughs> reflecting back at us. Mm. So, so in other words, so, so let's say I'm a man and I've got this arrogant man bam, bombarding me and I feel like sort of attacking him as a result. If, if, if that's the case, generally the emotion inside of me is really that I too, he's just a, exposing an emotion that I actually am in denial of inside of me. And that's why I don't like him much. Does that make sense? Yeah. Often yeah. there's that reflection. Yeah. So every time, I, every time, uh, any, any time we feel that we don't like somebody, it'd be a great thing for us to go, okay, there's something in them that I actually don't like inside of me, mm. and this is why I don't like them. Mm. Something in them that I am in judgment about that's inside of me, and this is why I don't want to spend time with them. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Yeah. And once we allow ourselves to see that, we can be even more self-reflective and there'll be even less projection going at the spirit. But, but if we can't do that, at least do the first thing. <laughs> at mm -hmm. least recognise, okay, yep, my behaviour right at the moment is unloving. Well, there's another thing I've got to note yeah. down in my little box, <laughs> you know, yeah. about my own unloving behaviour, you know. And I don't know about you, but when I began this process, I had about 80 pages of unloving behaviour <laughs> that I had to work my way through. And the way I listed it was I listed what is the truth and what is my unloving behaviour, right? Mm. <laughs> and so I actually had a book I carried around with myself that I just added on to the end. And there's another thing that I just noticed about myself that was out of harmony with love. So I write that down. Doo -doo -doo. And, and at least if I'm not a, a addressing it emotionally there and then, at least I can go back to that and go and connect with that feeling again and go, yeah, I was laughing at the spirit. Yeah, it was because their denial was absurd. Yeah, well, you know, where is my denial observed? You know, that's something I need to have a look at inside of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is denial so funny to me? I've got to look at that as well. Like, uh, you know, because it's not really funny. It affects all sorts of things really badly. Right, so, yeah. so it's not really a funny thing. So, you know, I'd have to ask myself those questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. I feel like it's related. You know that disillusioned feeling is what we talked about? Yeah. I feel like there's that feeling for you, Alexis, you know, like, oh, mm -hmm. it's all wrecked anyway, and it's yeah, sort it's of laugh about it. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. Yeah. stuff, and, you know. It's kind of, it's yeah. kind of comical, comical now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true, I do kind Which of Which covers over it. lots of grief. Grief, yeah. 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 Is it Mike? Thank you. Sorry. I'm just going back to the arrogance. Um, I'm just coming to the terms with that I may have been mediumistic for some time. And um, I feel that I've used that very arrogantly in analysing people mm -hmm. because I've gone into my head because they've triggered in something in me that I don't want to feel. Yeah. So you know, hence my comments about Peter, you know, you analyse them and, yeah. and then that's their little box and then you don't have to look at your own. Exactly. But it's all up in my head. So I um, just wanted to clarify, you know, when you say people get out of their body, yeah. It, it, it would actually mean that they go into their intellect or they... Often go in heavily into their intellect. Or if you like me, you just go... Or way out or, 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 or fog yeah. out. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't yeah. know yeah. how I feel. Yeah. I just would, So that's a sign of being overcloaked or not in your body. Yes. Can I mention too that many of you who feel you are accurately analysing other people are actually having quite dark spirits connect to you in those moments who do tell you some truth about the other person's actual emotion, mm -hmm. but not for the purpose of helping the other person, mm -hmm. but rather for the purpose of making you feel better than the other person. That's what I was just suspecting yep. when you were talking. Yep. Yeah. And so these darker spirits, what they're doing is they're feeding your addictions for making yourself feel better about yourself and so forth by pulling down another individual and remaining blind to your own injury at the same time. You see, the, the beauty of self-reflection is it does the opposite thing. You see, so a celestial spirit would come to you in that regard, and instead of helping you analyze Peter, he would help you analyze why you're so offended by Peter. Yeah. <laughs> does that make yeah. sense? Yes, and does. he would help you look at the emotion inside of yourself that causes you to respond in the manner that you're doing. 
And and for example, if uh, like with with the issue you mentioned before, mm -hmm. he'll be helping you focus on this very strong sense of injustice that you feel between men and women, and how strongly you feel quite righteously angry about that particular issue. Yeah. And the celestial spirit will be focusing on that, and he'll be focusing on how much grief there is inside of you, and how afraid you are of feeling that grief about how women get treated, and particularly historically, how women have been treated much worse than men. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And he, that spirit will be helping you connect with that emotion. Mm -hmm. Whereas this other spirit comes along, and he's not helping you, or she is not helping you connect with that emotion, She's helping you connect with this emotion. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I, I can work Peter out. You know, I can even know that he's gone to a boarding school, an all-male boarding school. I can even know that, you know, all these things, these, these things that you get told, many of them are true, but the purpose of getting told them is to actually pull the person down in your own heart while at the same time elevating yourself so that you don't have to feel the grief associated with the other emotions that are triggered. Does that make sense? And that, uh, I'm, yes, that makes sense. And that's the, you know some of the comments about responsibility in book club group yesterday. Uh, this week has been very interesting, yeah. and um, and I have realised that just because you know the truth, so that was coming from my injury. Just because you know the truth or a truth. Well, actually, in a lot of well, for a lot of us, it's actually just because we think we know the truth yeah. because actually for a lot of us at this stage the truth is still just entered our mind and many of it much of it hasn't entered our mind even completely and sometimes for many of us it hasn't even touched our heart in some areas at all like mm. for many of you for example the law of free will has yet to even touch your heart many of you misunderstand it completely you have lots of different judgments about that particular one law about love and so it's yet to even touch that but you think you know it does that yes. make sense? And then you yes. spout all of these things because yes. you think you know it, but, but the, the heart and also the actions demonstrate there is no knowledge. There's no real understanding. Yeah. Thank you. Can I congratulate you on your self-reflection? Yeah, that's oh. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you see, um, just say something to the group, can you see when we have a group where we're self-reflective, a lot of times we start with a bit of resistance to it, right? And then we start getting into it. We start, well, I'm discovering things about myself here. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. And, and you start actually feeling buoyant, even though you're looking at things that you would normally try to be, you know, <laughs> shutting down and rejecting. Can you see that? Like, you want to find more. Yeah, you want to find more. It's like a discovery process. And, and, yeah, and that's relevant to your mediumship nights. Because keep in mind, all of this self-discovery is encouraged in the context of love, isn't it? Mm. No one's up here shaming you for what you're figuring out. We're going, awesome. That's wonderful to know that, you know. So if you take the same approach and apply that to the spirits that you're speaking with, if you do it not from a sense of self-righteousness with them, but from a sense of, hey, we can discover things here and it'll help you, that's going to help them feel more encouraged in their process. Yeah, and you can even discover things with, for, with the spirit that can actually help you yeah, yeah, while yeah. you're helping them yeah. discover yeah. these things. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. um, can I go on? Sorry, because we've got a certain amount of time, and I'm just okay. conscious of it. Yeah, yes. we need to proceed. Uh, okay. What, what do you want to mention? I just had a little message from the spirits uh, just on that last bit of self righteousness. Yeah. Um, basically, we're talking about a sense of condemnation that comes towards spirits. And just some of your spirit friends wanted to remind you that some of you have the injury of being quite condemnatory towards others because you feel you know the truth. But sometimes when that gets turned around and you recognise something about yourself, you can get condemnatory of yourself. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And that's equally unloving. So just to be aware of that as well. So, so anger or condemnation towards yourself is just as unloving as anger or condemnation, condemnation towards another, mm -hmm. and often we condemn others because we condemn ourselves. Yeah, does so that make sense? So, so sometimes we're very harsh with ourselves, and as a result of that, we are very harsh mm -hmm. with others mm -hmm. as well. Like, so we just need to be conscious of that. The second aspect, which I'm starting to raise, uh, that we need to raise. So that was the first issue of self-righteousness. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The second a avenue or, or aspect that I would like to raise with you is the selfishness attached to mediumship. 
And what I would like to just, what I will do is I'll raise the points they've raised and then we can discuss them in more detail. Firstly, their feelings are that there is a gen, generally a lack of desire to serve the Spirit. Mm -hmm. yes. Right? Or a lack of desire to serve the person that mediumship is given to on earth. Often instead, there is a desire to attack the person on earth by using the mediumship, to making them feel worse and you feeling better about yourself. And in the case with the spirit, there is a feeling of dismissal sometimes, a lot of the times, like, hurry on, get on, you know, get on with it. And when you're not getting on with it yet, like, so there's also that kind of a feeling. There is a desire to take from spirits. And in particular, this comes at Angelo, in your group but many of you also have a desire to take from your own celestial friends so a feeling of wanting they've got to tell you what's wrong with your life and then when they tell you you go oh no um, I don't agree with a lot of that and then you want them to tell you something more and of course by this stage they go well the last thing that I told you you didn't want to accept why should I tell you something more right so you've already rejected the gift I've just given you how can you want more? And then this brings me to the third point they raise, that the gifts of the truth that they give you or the love, or the love that they give you are not received humbly or with gratitude. Now, if I can say, so for example, a spirit comes along and tells you something about yourself emotionally. Instead of sitting with it, and actually working through the issue over the period of the next week or fortnight or month or however long it takes you to do so, many of you receive it and then go, oh, I'd like to know more now. In a way, you, like, there's this, like, you just got something that's quite life-changing if you actually do something about it. And instead of just sitting on that and waiting whether the Spirit wanted to give you more or not, you then want something more straight afterwards. And, and, and the Spirit's doing two things. He's going, well, firstly, you just dismissed the first thing. And secondly, you haven't dealt with the first thing. And before I can share the second thing, you need to deal with the first thing. And so the Spirit now is a, you know, it finds it very difficult to engage you in this process of feeding you more and more information without, addressing, without you addressing the emotion. So you see, somebody can feed you lots of information but it doesn't mean that you're going to address any of it, right? And often that's the case, isn't it? Like you, many of you know, even with the seminars and stuff that I've presented, that sometimes years later you've gone back to it and you go, oh, that's what he said. Like, <laughs> I, like at the time you thought you, were, you knew it, right? And then years later you, you sort of it dawns on you that you didn't even know it for that entire time. And, and so if you had some feeling of respect for our celestial friends, you'd realize that they do have your best interests at heart, and when they share something with you, it is best to not dismiss it. <laughs> it is best to actually reflect upon it much more deeply than we often do. D does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The fourth thing they mention is that many of you have a desire to move on spirits who are attacking you or who are angry. You want to get rid of them. You, hurt. you want to push them on, you know? Get on with your life and get away from me. You know, that you want, and the reason why you want to do it is that you want relief from their projection. So it's a selfish desire to get rid of them so you get some relief from them. And you often, too, have an agreement with the unloving position of the spirit. So, so, for example, if an angry woman comes along and she starts telling you about her life and she's been raped and she's been abused by a man and then she was murdered by a man, you by now, if you're a person who's, who's had some of those things perhaps happen to you or heard about those things happening to other women, or have this multi-generational injury that most women have that we don't deserve any of that. You are now in a rage about these men and how bad these men have been with this woman. And, and now, do you think you're helping her now? How can you help her? you actually got exactly the same feeling she has and exactly the same emotion. And it's impossible now to help her work, get to grief because you're in a rage. You're not even in your grief about what's happened to her. So how can you help her be in her grief about what's happened to her? Can you see? And so um, often what we do is we, 
we actually are holding the spirit in a place where they can't change because now they've got commiseration with us about why their life is so bad and why they should be angry or why their life is so bad and why they should feel shame or why their life is so bad and why they've got a lot of grief and, and that's the reason why they punish men now and you can say, yeah, beauty, go ahead and punish the more men because that's what I feel like doing as well, right? And many of, of you ladies who are angry feel like punishing more men. That's one reason why you're not attracting men into your life, because you're punishing them. And many of you men mm. feel like pandering to women and feel this sense of arrogance over women and feel this sense that uh, because the women are emotional and you're not emotional, that means you've got things together and they haven't. And, and so these are emotions that are projected at, at these spirits at the same time. They also said that there is a selfish motivation to release the spirit from your law of attraction with the spirits. So in other words, when a group of spirits come who are angry women, so you often say oh, there's a group of spirits who are angry women here with us, instead of going, wow, why is this group of spirits here? What inside of me causes the attraction with these group of spirits? How much do I agree with them? How much do I, or in the men's case, how much am I frightened of them and I don't even want to go, you know, I want to run away, you know, and instead of like standing up for truth, many of you men don't want to stand up for truth when it comes to persons who are angry and particularly women who are angry. And, and so now you've got this selfish motivation to just get rid of them. Can we, can we talk to someone else instead? <laughs> Not realising that this is a beautiful attraction. Mm -hmm to help the whole group deal with specific things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the last thing um, they mentioned, which I feel is a very important thing too, they said, um, you're presenting mediumship as a ray to correct people, either on earth or in the spirit world, rather than actually personally living the path of love, truth and humility as a way of helping people to correct themselves. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're actually sort of using mediumship as a tool to change people because we want them to change, mm -hmm. whether that's a spirit or a person on earth who we're channeling to or a spirit that we're saying we're helping. We're, we're actually wanting that spirit to change or we want the person on earth that we're helping to change rather than actually ourselves living a life of humility, humility humility, <laughs> love and truth. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, our mediumship becomes used as a tool to attack people. Does that, mm -hmm. everyone gets that? Mm -hmm. We're attacking the person that we're put giving mediumship to by actually telling them the whole thing of things about themselves because mm -hmm. we want them to change. That's the only reason why it's coming out of our mouth. And many times it's coming out of your mouths uninvited, by the way. If you think about much of your mediumship, those of you who have been doing mediumship with other people, you say, you go up to them, we hear this very often lately, you go up to a person and say, my spirit guides wanted to tell you, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and what you've just done, firstly, is you've given, you've given information uninvited to the person. Do you think it's a celestial spirit giving you this information? Mm. What does a celestial spirit do? He asks you first whether you want the information. <laughs> he would at least ask the person, do you want to know what, what the Spirit says? My spirit wants, your, spirit, your spirit friends wants to tell you something. Do you want to know? They'd at least ask you that. Yeah. This is not a celestial spirit. It's not a natural love spirit. It's a spirit in the hells trying to cause trouble and trying to be overtly controlling and manipulative on the person that you're telling the information to. Or it can be a spirit who you like to have around you to protect you. So, AJ, you've got a lot of anger with women. So let's say I am angry with women. And, right? and I'm a male. And yeah. Mary's a female. So she, she, she comes to me and goes... My spirit guides feel you really need to work on your anger with women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and? <laughs> How do I do that? But the subtext is... I really don't like your anger with women. Could you please deal with that so I don't have to feel about it? So, so I don't have to put up with it anymore. Can you see? Yeah. yeah. And so, so, and and if if and I can come up to Mary and go, my spirit guides say that, and away I go. Like my You've spirit. got a lot of 
I get some good ones <laughs> about sexual shame. Or, or another one that we see quite often. Um, you're actually quite afraid of me, aren't you? <laughs> what do you, you think the subtext with that? is with that? What, what's the subtext in that, do you think? It's all about Don't you. <laughs> well, there's two types, isn't it? If I'm saying to, to Mary, she, you're really quite afraid of me, aren't you? Sometimes the subtext is, you should be quite afraid of me. Oh. And that's the spirit with the person wow. really saying to this person, you should be freaking out because of me. Mm. And oftentimes they should be freaking out in the sense that the spirit with the person saying that is often very, very dark. If I'm a really humble person and I can feel every time I walk up to AJ, he's quaking in his boots, I wouldn't feel the need to go up to him and go, you're quite afraid of me, aren't you? <laughs> or, Are you afraid of me? I'd go, whoa, my brother is a fearful every time I'm around. What is coming out of me? <laughs> and if you really loved him, you'd be, you'd be looking at, okay, Firstly, what can I do inside of myself? Like, is there things inside of me that cause a man to be afraid around me? So if you were a woman and the man's afraid of you all the time, the first thing you need to do is go, OK, what's coming out of me towards men that would cause men to be afraid of me? And then I go, OK, yeah, like, I actually feel quite bad about men, actually. You know, like, I, I feel like, you know... I, if I was a man, I'd probably like to punch them in the nose, actually. <laughs> you know, that, that, and you're honest with yourself. You could work through a lot of things. And then if you, after you've done all that, you go, well, actually, I don't know if there is anything coming out of me. There's still really no reason to come up to the person and tell them, you're quite afraid of me, are you? Because you'd be going, what can I do to help my brother be no longer afraid of women? Because he's obviously afraid of women. Mm -hmm. So what can I do to help him no longer be afraid of women? So, you know, you could go and speak with him and, and just say, look, I've noticed that you're pretty afraid of women. Like, is it, instead of going, you're afraid of me. Or are you afraid of me? Or, or you could go, do you, do you feel you're afraid of women? You know? Um, what, and the, what, what, like, is there anything that you know what to do about it? Like, because it's obviously harming your life. And mm -hmm. if you were loving, you would, you probably want to ask them those kind of questions. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the other thing that's come up that I've heard people discuss, and I'm, I, I don't sort of understand it logically, is that people have a fear of helping a spirit and releasing them from them, and then if they haven't dealt with the emotion, they may get a worse spirit. So to my way of thinking, all right, I might help 20 spirits with that injury that I have, until I'm able to release it. But is there a problem with that? Like, isn't that, do you know what I mean? Like people are in so much fear of releasing this spirit because they've still got the injury. There is only one time that's a problem. And that is if we are in total denial of the emotional reason why the spirit is attracted to us in the first place. So if we are in total denial of the emotional reason, then we will be attracting a new spirit with the same condition or perhaps even a worse condition while we remain in denial. Um, so that's the only time I see it being a problem. But now, if, if we're we following use, the path... And if we use that as problem. an excuse, oh, I can't help that spirit because it might mean I'm not going to deal with anything and that means I'll get a bad... There's a lot of... Um, fear in there. Not just fear, lack of humility, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. There's a feeling like, well, I can't even, I'm not going to love myself enough to feel, I'm not going to love them enough to be able to grow, um, or because I'm just afraid. Yeah, and it's not a trusting God's law of attraction. Like, not at all. if it does intensify, well, then that's sort of what I need to that, yeah, deal yeah. with this emotion. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Quite often, uh, we do with our day-to-day -day life, even, and this is something we all need to look at. We create comfort in our day-to-day -day life, and the reason why we create the comforts we create is to avoid what makes us uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Mm. So, so, for example, many people live in a city because they want to avoid the discomfort of some of the things you've got to do in the country that you, can't, that you can get away with do, doing, uh, you don't have to do in the city, for example. Mm. So, so we've got to be very careful that we're not doing the same with our you know, spirit interaction as well. We're just trying to create personal comfort all the time mm. so that we are the you know, we, we're constantly focused on me, 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 me. And this is what they're referring to with the selfishness in the mediumship. If I'm, if I'm focused on loving the person, the spirit who I'm helping, 
But then I'm not going to be saying, oh, if I get rid of this spirit, I'll get a worse spirit, so I don't want to get rid of this spirit. Like, I wouldn't say that ever, would I? No. I would be focused on helping the person. Of course I'm going to help them. It doesn't matter what's going to happen to me. I'd still want to help them yeah. if I had a real selfless feeling of helping them. That's how I would feel. So I wouldn't be going into this selfish place of going, wow, if I get rid of this one, then a worse one might come along. And this one I know, I might as well keep him away. Or we wouldn't also do like, this one's really nice, you know, he meets a lot of my addictions. And, yeah. you know, if I get rid of him, mm. then I'll feel bad about this and I'll feel bad about that. And he projects at me some sexual feelings that make me feel really good and, and everything. And if I get rid of him, then I won't have that anymore. And I feel real lonely and I feel like I need a man on earth then. And who wants a man on earth? And, you know, like, so, so I might even go through all this reasoning where I d decide even to retain that emotional addiction with the spirit because of my own selfishness. And uh, those things are not serving ourselves in the long run or the spirit who, who we're saying that we sh we, we're wanting to help. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. AJ, just to clarify the, uh, the the fact that a, a celestial spirit will ask if the person wants... Always. Wants. Now, David, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go up and say, do you want this material? Rather than looking at whether you're actually channeling celestial spirits or not. The majority of the time you are not channeling celestial spirits, but rather very dark spirits, even when you think you're helping someone. And you're not examining that. And as a result, there's this tendency in you then to do the rope thing, you know, the thing, oh, AJ said that, you know, the celestial spirit would ask, so now I'm going to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't change the spirit with you. Do, you. do you understand? The spirit with you would have already been motivating you to ask before I said it. So the fact that he hasn't been means that you aren't channeling the spirit you're thinking you're channeling when you're giving this information to another. Does that make sense? Yeah, having a little bit of difficulty actually receiving it. Exactly, because the spirit with you does not want you to see that he's not a celestial spirit. He doesn't want you to see that... See, you, his, his relationship has been established with you because of your acceptance of what you believe his condition to be rather than you knowing what his condition is. Whereas the difference between that and myself at the moment is I can feel his condition. And his condition is not anywhere above a first fear condition, right? But you're channeling him as if he's a celestial spirit because he channels accurately many times the emotions that are in the other person. Do you understand? And yes, he does that, but you know why he does that? To make you feel good. To make you feel like you know things. To make you feel like you're better than the other person. That's why he does it. And therefore there's some emotions in you where you want to feel better than the other person. And that covers a whole series of grief where you feel worse than the other person. Does that make sense? So he's just helping you avoid how bad you feel about yourself when you're with other people. By making you feel better than, you, than the other person. By giving you information about the other person that is emotional in nature so that you assume that he's a celestial spirit giving you information. And then when I address the issue with you, he's trying to shut you down. And don't listen to this, don't listen yeah, to this. Yeah, you know, don't, don't trust this, don't, you know, he's saying that to you right now. He's going, don't trust this, don't listen to this. I want to maintain, I am a celestial spirit, how dare he say that? And can you feel his anger with me? Well, I can feel something, and he, he sees applying a pr pressure to me. Yeah, so, so the, if it was a celestial spirit, would he be angry with what I'm saying? No, I mean, I, I, I can feel... This guy, particularly, mm -hmm. uh, he's not a celestial spirit. Yeah. Have there been times when I have actually channeled the likes of Peter and Jocelyn? Now you want to feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, can, can you see? Can you see? If I am in any condition of love, I will not be feeding your addiction. No, yeah. This is what you yeah. want. You want me to feed your addiction. Yeah. Your addiction okay. is. Please tell me that I've done something right. Yes. Right. Yes. Because otherwise I feel just worse about myself then, yeah. <laughs> can you see? Instead of just allowing yourself to feel what you feel from the interaction. The danger that many of you are in with these spirits is that these spirits have learned that all they need to do is use the terminology of divine love. And because you are yet to release a lot of your own grief and your own sadness and your own fears and your own anger, you can't tell through feeling whether these spirits are brighter or darker. 
because you, you can only tell when a spirit's brighter or darker by releasing the dark emotions within yourself. And so what these spirits do is give you the facade feeling of, well, I feel pretty bright because I can tell what, Ma I know what Mary's emotions are. I can sit there in the group and while Mary's doing her, you know, book club, and uh, there she is, and she, she, she's not feeling that, and she's not this, and she's feeling that, and, then, and I know all of this. Boy, this celestial spirit with me, he's so good, isn't he? And yet, it's not a celestial spirit with me. It's just a spirit in the spirit world who's been there probably for some time. He's learnt your language. He's learnt your lingo, as the saying goes, right? <laughs> And he knows that all he's got to do is feed you some of his of the lingo and you'll start going, oh, I know this stuff. And, and all he's doing is pandering to the feeling of desire for glory or approval or whatever inside of yourself or feeling like power, powerful, because you know things that other people don't know. Mm. And in the process of doing that, you are darkening your own condition by feeding that addiction. Mm. And that's all he's doing. And he's establishing a greater connection with you through this process making you believe he's something that he is not. And then when I come along and challenge it, he gets angry. And, or you, you sort of go, what did you say? And then I, start, I say it again. And, oh, sorry, what did you say? Like, <laughs> you know, that kind of feeling where it all seemed to have gone away for that moment that the important thing was said. And these are indications that the spirits are falsifying their condition to you. And why would they be doing that? You're only getting something out of the interaction too, I imagine. Yes, but, yeah. but see how you don't want to still look at your own addiction. Yeah. Your first thing you mention is what they're getting yeah. out of the interaction. Can you see, we've got to start with what we're getting out of the interaction. That's the whole point. And yeah, our spirit friends did give some specific uh, feedback for the men and the women in the group, mm -hmm. and that probably fits here. Mm -hmm. So they said dominantly for the men in the group, there's the issue of arrogance mm. and using mediumship arrogantly. Uh, using mediumship to avoid emotions. So AJ just uh, gave that example. Mm. We're feeding your addictions. To feeding it. your addictions. Yeah. Yep. Um, and presenting truth without love or humility. So they're the dominant things for the men in the group to look at. Yeah. Um, so. Is it related to that, Matt, what you want to ask? Yeah. We'll just keep going with Dave for a minute. So even if, I'm, even if I pray beforehand about being of service... Is your prayer sincere, Dave? Is the dominant emotion an addiction? Because the, the addiction is the prayer. Remember that, that your true see. feelings are the prayer. So if your true feeling is, I want my addiction met, then what do you think is going to happen? It's going to get That's made. the prayer. That's what's going to happen. Does it make sense? Yep. So it's very, very important to understand that. And you can pray to a God to protect you or whatever from this, but, but the reality is, why would God invent a law where the law of attraction comes to expose a condition in you and then prevent you from feeling the effects of that condition? <laughs> can you see that oftentimes we're praying, we're praying to God basically and we're saying, God, in this particular occasion, can you just forgo <laughs> that law and forgo that law and forgo that law and look after me? And God does none of those things ever. Do, do you understand? God does not protect us from his own laws. He, he established every law that he has because he loves you and, they, and, and the establishment of these laws are the expression, one of the expressions of his love for you and will help you get to a condition of love the most rapidly. That's why he created them. And why would he then deny the expression of one of those laws just because you want to avoid something at a certain moment? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And the truth is when you have a really deep feeling of desiring humility, like being humbled in, that, in, a, in a moment or in a period of time where you are really humble, you're really looking at your addictions and there is a true desire for service, you don't need to forego the law. Mm. You're going to attract celestial spirits and you're going to be able to serve. It's always based on the truth of what's in your heart. And I feel that's a very important point that Mary mentioned because if you have a pure, passionate desire to love and you want to be humble and you want truth more than anything else that you want, then who, what kind of spirit are you going to attract? Yeah. Of course you're going to respect a different, attract a different kind of spirit. 
you're not going to be in your addictions attracting one type, you'll be attracting another type of spirit. And even if you attract the dark spirit, you'll be in this beautiful place where you'll be able to either assist them or through the interaction you'll help yourself and them. Through the, through the the, there's so many possibilities in that place. And this is where it's something also that we've been talking about in the book group, but oh, I'm not in the condition, like now, now all this has been said, it's clear I'm not even in the condition to serve, I can't do anything. You know, which is missing the point again. Exactly. So we don't want to shut down the mediumship now because, ah, uh, you know, uh, AJ's basically indicated that all We're my all, mediumship's in addiction. Yep. So what's the point of doing any of it anymore? Sure, surely what we want to do is go, instead of going there, say, right, yes, I can start seeing that there's addiction here and I see that, you know, there's some dark spirits involved here. I want to change that. The way I'm going to change that mm. is not by intellectually trying to do something to change it, but rather addressing the core emotional reasons why I'm addicted to power, in, in the, in, for example, in your case. And addiction to power <laughs> covers a fear about being powerless. So, so, so I'm addicted to power, so I have to admit that first. Then I would go into the thing, okay, I'm obviously afraid of having no power at all. And then uh, underneath that is the fact that during my childhood, and in your case, Dave, during your childhood, you had no power, zero power. You were given no power at all. You were under the control of men and women around you constantly. This is the reason why you want the power, because you don't want to grieve the emotion of being powerless. D does that make sense? So, so once we understand that, we, we realised that within a few weeks we could heal this emotion mm. and be in a totally different place if we're prepared to grieve the powerless feeling. Right? Then we can change. But if we focus on, ah, oh, yeah, I just like the power, man, you know, like I, I just want to make, have that feeling that I know what Mary's feeling and thinking with that. And a lot of times I know even when Mary doesn't know. It doesn't feel good. It makes me feel powerful over Mary. It makes me feel like I've got control of her. Or if even if I don't have control of her, I can have this nice, smug, self-satisfied feeling, you know, like, yeah, there's a lot of people here who've got no idea what's happening, really. You know, and it makes me feel like I know what's happening and nobody else does and those kind of things. And, and that's covering the emotion that we need to feel. That, that's just feeding, the, or pandering to the addiction. And, and the spirits with us are experts at pandering to your addiction. Why? So they can meet their own addictions. Does that make sense? There's always something going on in the other direction as well that they benefit from in this process. And in that way, we're prostituting ourselves to them as well. So they, they're assisting us with our um, unloving desire, but you can guarantee you're going to be assisting them in some kind of unloving desire. So what does the spirit get out of this interaction where he's making you feel powerful, making you feel like he's your celestial guide, making you feel like he knows things about... What does he get out of that? You then honour him, you then feel connected to him all the time, you listen to the other things he says, some of which might be quite misleading, and when another woman comes along who, uh, he, he, that he feels like he wants to have sex with, you'll feel like, I, he'll just say, she's your soulmate, and away you go in that direction. Do you, do you know what I mean? There's a lot of things he gets out of this codependent relationship, right? These things have happened to you, have they not? And, and, and so they get to feed the... They, their own desires and passions through this, through this unhealed interaction. And that's the danger. And that's the danger. If we don't see the danger, it can become, become quite dark for us very rapidly. Now, for many of us, what would happen is that they would use us, use us, use us. We'd use them, we use them, we use them. We can't, we can't forget that we use them. They're using us, we're using them. They're using us, we're using them until we get to the point where it starts feeling a bit creepy. Mm. Now, we would prefer to see that happen within a few weeks <laughs> than 10 years. years later. Mm. Do you understand? For many of us, it happens years later. But we, we go on for years and years and years before we realise something's actually happened. And it's far better if we can realise in weeks or even days, well, this is what's happening. The last time you gave me feedback about my mediumship, um, you said, don't stop, 
um, but I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and this time don't stop, no, but no. refine, you know, yes. refine. Yeah, so yeah. suggestions on how to refine? I've already given them to you. Right. The, okay. the, if you think about everything we've just put, talked about, yeah, you'll be able to replace, hopefully, this if it's recorded and everything over and over, and, and you'll be able to see what's going on in your own mediumship and realise that the only way to refine mediumship is, is to also refine yourself. Like you can't avoid refining yourself. So, so if you focus everything on refining yourself in love, in harmony with love, truth and humility, then your mediumship will automatically be refined. Do, do you see? But when I focus firstly on the mediumship and trying to refine the mediumship without refining myself, Trying to fix it. All I'll get is another little spirit come along. He thinks, right, he's got rid of the other fella, but I want some of the same things. And all I need to do is use a bit of a different language now, because I've heard this discussion that AJ's had with David. So I know that, okay, I'm just not. So I'm going to say to David, I'll say to David, ask the person first before you give them the meeting. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it. it's quite easy, isn't it, for a spirit? And if you can't feel this, see, the problem is that you can't feel these spirits. If, well, you, if you could feel them properly, then you would know what they're doing. But, but the problem is you can't feel them because you want the addiction, man. Mm. Yeah, I feel the, the main issue is the obsession with the addiction. Because a lot of you are sensitive. You can, if you, you can desire feel. to know, you can feel. But it's the... the um, the ongoing, I can't think of any other word than obsession with getting the addiction met, that just desensitizes blinds. us. It blinds yeah. us. It's sort of like, you, you know what it's like for a person who's an alcoholic who, who starts drinking. What does he do? He's drinking away, and his wife's saying to him, oh, I think you're being a drunkard. You know, you, you, you know, and then he starts even beating his wife. And, and, it and a lot of times he gets down to a really dark condition before he goes, Whoa, I'm an alcoholic. I've got an addiction to alcohol and I'm drinking all the time every day and it's affecting my entire life. But often it has to get really bad before he'll do that. And many times even then he won't annoy it because he's obsessed with the addiction so much that he doesn't even want to change. And, and the, the truth is for many of us, we are obsessed with our addictions. We, often we don't want to change. And we've got to admit that to ourselves before we can even begin to change. Right? Some of us are obsessed with the addiction of wanting to be happy all the time. And so some spirits come along and make you feel happy all the time. And you go, oh, I'm happy all the time. Isn't it funny? Isn't it like everything's funny? Everything's a joy. Everything's funny. Oh, I'm so, I'm so in love with the divine love path. It's so wonderful. These celestial spirits are so much. Oh, it's so wonderful. You know, and the reality is they're just feeding the obsession of wanting to be happy all the time rather than just be whatever, you know, yourself, happy or sad, whatever the feeling is. Some of us have an obsession to be the victim all the time. Mm. Huh? Mm. And we love it when everybody in the room feels sorry for us. And so, so we get some spirits with us and they start telling us things about our life and they start saying things, oh, you've had this happen in your life, some of which has not happened. Oh, you've had that happen in your life. And we start thinking it's even a memory of our own making. And we, and we start creating all of these things because we can play the victim and everyone around us goes, oh, isn't it terrible? She's had such a terrible life. Oh, so, oh I'm so sorry. You know, give you a hug. And we're obsessed with getting the hugs. You know, rather than feeling alone or sad or disillusioned or some of the other darker emotions that we sometimes have. And this is what we've got to be, you know, be real about. And understand, many times these spirits are cleverer than you. Mm -hmm. They're cleverer than you. They've been around longer than you. They know how to lie better than you. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. now, some of them have been around thousands of years, lying to 25, 30, 50, 100 people, lived a whole life with people, lying to them. For hundreds of years, you know, hundreds of years have been with heaps of different people. Do you, think, do you think they know every trick in the book? So what's the only way to deal with that? You have to be open and sensitive enough to feel them. How do you get open and sensitive enough to feel them? 
by being open and sensitive to all of your oh, own feelings. But could I add to that? Because I feel like a lot of times then people go, right, I've just got to feel my emotions. I've just got to feel my emotions. I've just got to feel my emotions. I've got to get more humble. I've got to get more... And that doesn't work for me. There has, I have to be driven by a desire. loving desire, mm -hmm. which is to, to serve or to become more loving myself. Mm -hmm. um, and many times because of anger, we don't have that desire. And so that's the place to start. I don't have that desire, I'm angry and open to that. And, and if you think about it, remember every time we don't get an addiction met, we revert to anger, mm -hmm. don't we? Mm -hmm. So, so when, when we hear AJ's basically saying to me that most of the spirits, so I'm basically saying to Dave that most of the spirits that connect with Dave are first fear spirits who falsify their identity to Dave to make him feel better about himself than he actually feels. And to make him feel like he's got his life under control when he doesn't really feel like he's got his life under control yet, right? So that's what I'm basically saying. So then Dave goes, okay, well, I have some options here. And usually we take one of these options. We usually go, I'm never doing a mini trip again. It's too, too, too dangerous, I'm not, not doing it again. Now straight away we've turned off what is potentially a passionate desire, a natural part of our soul. And that's not a good choice really, is it? You see that? <laughs> or we go down the track of going, I'm, I want to feel angry with OJ because he's, I, I want to have this spirit with me. I don't believe him. I don't believe him. He's not, you know, no, I'm not going to test anything he says. I don't believe him. I'm just going to go on my merry way. And often we feel angry with the person telling us that information. And that's really not going to be very conducive because in the end, all, all that's going to happen is we'll get our, our addiction met. And if our addiction gets met, who's going to progress? neither the spirit nor ourselves. The third option is what Mary's suggesting. Understand you still have a desire, but, but refine it in love. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, refine it. Allow it to be refined through a process that is going to cause you to become more loving. So, can you see that even greater than the desire for mediumship, I need to have a desire for refining my own soul. Mm. Do, do you see that? Yes. So, we've, so we can have a desire for mediumship, but even greater than that desire, we need to have a desire, we need to create a desire within us to refine our own soul so that our mediumship is pure and enjoyable for everyone, not only just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Mm -hmm. So. When we have a focus on refining our soul, getting and of course the fastest way to refine your soul is getting closer to God. And the <coughs> fastest way to do that is by the process that you're learning, humility, truth and love, and in this relationship with God first. So what I find for most people is they don't yet really understand the ba this basic truth. If you put first your relationship with God Every other desire that you have will automatically become refined and it will automatically be exposed to you and your life will automatically become more enjoyable. For many of us what we do with our passions and desires is we put our passion and desire ahead of God and even ahead of refining our own soul. Right? And so what we end up with then is, a, is some of our desire mixed in with a lot of addictions. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger in mediumship or in any other passion that we have. We can have the same danger in the arts, we can have the same danger in any other thing we choose to do. And this is where if we have a focus on God first, our desire for a relationship with God first, it's going to pull us through any trauma or trouble that we receive along the way. Mm -hmm. But if you have a desire for the mediumship first, there's many mediums on the planet who have a desire for the mediumship first, and those people sit down in back areas of town, generally, in their little booths, dishing out half-truths to people because they haven't got a developed enough soul to attract a spirit who can give full truth. They dish out half-truths for 25 to $100 an hour or maybe even more, depending on how well-known they are. And that's not a very pure way to use your mediumship. 
but it's certainly an option if you want to go down that way. And, and this is where we'll end up if we don't address some of these addictions. Oh. You want to? oh no, just Matt had his hand. I just wondered if it was about the man stuff. Yeah. But, oh no. Because we haven't covered the woman stuff yet. No. <laughs> was it about the man stuff yeah. that you wanted yeah. to ask yeah, yeah. the question? So that's so, us. Sorry, Laura. And then we'll just go to the women's yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, what, what I know, I kind of just realised, I guess, when, when you guys were talking, that sometimes it's happened that I've been in a conversation with a woman and an emotion gets triggered in me and then ooh, it's the mediumship's coming on kind of thing and that's like and then i want to tell them about their their unlovingness and all that is you wanting to avoid how you just felt yeah yeah, yeah. and the spirit yeah. with you is not a celestial spirit doing that no. he's just helping you avoid how you feel and to give the woman what for yeah basically you know? yeah. in Thank other you. words let's give the woman a punch in the arm and see how that goes <laughs> now that she's punched me in the arm <laughs> that's the feeling right and it can only get worse from there on, you know, remember how do war start? <laughs> That's how war start, isn't it? Yeah. And it's exactly what we're doing oftentimes, even with our brothers and sisters, unfortunately. Yeah. Eagle? In, in general, AJ, when you're saying desire, desire for God will bring in harmony all other desires, you're also saying that um, desires that benefit all, right? Sorry, desires that benefit all. Yes, uh, real desire exercised purely will not just benefit yourself. You will receive huge amounts of joy from it yourself. But a but a pure desire exercised in a pure manner, in a loving manner, will always also benefit other people. So so let's say you're a passionate artist, and in the process of developing this passion that you have, you become an extremely good artist. And everybody looks at your painting and they feel, oh, that emotion and this emotion. And it's benefiting now, not just yourself. You're getting all this like, joy out of everyone enjoying your art. But, but it's, so it's not only benefiting yourself, but it also benefits every single person who comes in contact with your art. That's a true passion. Same with music, same with mediumship, same with any other passion that we could ever have. Anything that's a pure passion benefits far more than just ourselves at any one point in time. Yep. That's how there always ends up. Yep. So should we look at the women stuff and then basically... Yep. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. So this was mainly about the wounded women spirits who come. Uh, and many of the women, or almost all of the women in the group, actually agree with their viewpoint. So it goes back to that righteous anger place um, or this false compassion place where we feel for them and we also tacitly agree that they shouldn't actually have to deal with the pain and become more loving. Uh, yeah, so they're supporting the viewpoints of these women. And that was the main issue for the women. For the women. Yeah. So, it's a big one, though. does that? It is a big one. That, so. Not just for the group, probably for the society and the world. <laughs> yeah, that's enough to work on. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, what we've got to do there, as as women, is look at look at your hurt that you have with men, in particular. My thing's just going on and off. I don't feel like. Look at the hurt you have with uh, men, in particular. And rather than justifying it even to yourself all the time, start looking at the fact that there is a huge amount of grief in it that you need to allow yourself to feel. And that many of you have a huge amount of fear about feeling this grief because you feel that if you feel the grief, the men will be able to hurt you again. So, so one of the things we do with this anger is we we convince ourselves that if we feel it and release it all, then it leaves an opening for somebody to do the same damage to us again. And so we believe the anger is protective. Do you understand? It's yes. like the barbed wire fence around us. And if we get rid of it, oh my gosh, then I'm going to be soft and vulnerable with men and what might and, they do? And they'll attack me. The reality is that you will, in your life, receive far more attack when you are in a state of anger with men than you're ever going to when you're in a state of softness with men. But none of you believe that yet. Mm -hmm. 
right? Because the reality is many of you are doing exactly the opposite. Does that make sense? And, and when I say none of you believe that, literally none of you believe that yet. None of you actually believe that if you become soft and vulnerable and open and take risks with men, that you are actually going to be in a safer place than if you keep the barbed wires up and the barriers down. And Do you understand? That's what you believe. And this is immaterial of what your sexual orientation is. This is something you believe about men. So, and there's exactly what these spirits believe about men, by the way. Exactly the same thing. They believe that if you become open and vulnerable and put your defences down, that's when you get hurt. That's what they believe. And the other thing that I just feel inspired to talk about is about what happens then because all of us women have that same injury. As soon as a woman takes a step to take down the barbed wire, she not only faces her own fear, but there is a huge pressure from other women to put the barbed wire fence back up again. Mm -hmm. That she's being weak, that she's actually going to be controlled by the man, that she, you know, she's just setting us back 50 years in terms of women's lib and, you know, all this kind of projection. And how, like, that's a very unloving thing to project at your sisters, but also to be aware of that many times the reason we don't shift on this issue is not just about our unfelt grief and stuff with men, but it's also the terror we have of women. So what we've found in our relationship, that every time the barrier comes down in our relationship and there's less, uh, more risk-taking and less, less barriers between us, Mary gets attacked on the internet by other women saying that I'm controlling her. Every single time. Wow. Yep. And if you all really knew Mary, men, you would understand that she's not able to be easily <laughs> controlled. <laughs> and, and that's what I love about her. Uh, one of the things I love about her. <laughs> and so, so this is something that, you know, where she receives a lot of attack from women the instant that she re reduces a barrier within herself towards myself. And sadly, that is where I'm at now. That is some of the biggest blocks that I have because I'm really afraid of women. Or, yeah, I'm, I'm working on that feeling, mm -hmm. that feeling of feeling afraid. Of, it's not all women, but <laughs> there is a feeling. And there is this camaraderie feeling between women. The sisterhood. The sisterhood. Mm -hmm. And this is something that our spirit friends have been talking to us about for, for months oh, now. And um, this sisterhood basically is saying, don't any other woman have a different opinion to me? Mm. Because if you do, you've betrayed the whole women gender, mm. the, whole, the whole sex. You've yeah, betrayed us. Yeah. Right? And so oftentimes a woman who changes receives even more rage from other women mm. than she does from other men. Mm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And this is what keeps us locked oftentimes in a specific type of behavioural pattern. It's often the same gender. Many of you women see it in men. You know, like the man who goes out fishing and he, you know, he's away from his wife half of his life because he's out fishing, he's out doing this thing with his mates. And what's the feeling in you? That he loves his mates more than he loves you. Right? For many, many that's the case. And, and the reality is, you're dead right, he does. <laughs> does that make sense? Many times he does. He, he has this feeling that he, he, he gets a relief by doing that. His mates and, aren't projecting anything. And also, when his mates spend more time with you, when he spends more time with you, what does his mate say? Oh, you're, you're under the thumb. You're under, under the thumb. thumb. <laughs> you know, you get pushed around by the woman again, mate. The, you know. the handbrake. She's the handbrake. <laughs> And, and, and even worse, uh, more derogatory remarks, generally, right, uh, mate? Now, you can see that happening in men in some cases, and yet at the same time you're not seeing that happening often between yourselves. As women, yeah. As women. You know, this thing is also happening between yourselves. Where, but it's a different kind of pressure than, than the mateship mate thing. It's a sisterhood pressure. And it actually helps the genders remain aloof from each other. Mm. And in the celestial heavens, there is not a single meeting, a single event 
that doesn't have both male and women involved. There's not a single event. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. There is no, you know, baby shower without <laughs> men there. Do you understand? Bucks night. There's no bucks night. <laughs> <laughs> there's no hedge nights. There's no, you know, and you, you know, there's no women's group. There's no men's group. There's no, do you understand? Mm -hmm. They are all intermingled gender in the celestial heavens. Mm -hmm. Every single meeting. It's something that we feel very passionate about, which is probably why we're raving on about it. But um, this idea that only women understand women and men understand men is something that we feel so strongly that that's in error and that we really want to correct, isn't it? So uh, I remember a year or two ago, you were invited to a, a baby shower. You remember? No, like three years three ago. Three years ago. <laughs> Mary's invited to a baby shower and she really wanted to go, right? And then, she, so she, but she wanted me to come along too. So, so what she did is she rang up the person and said, look, like I really want to come to your baby shower, but I want to bring along AJ as well. <laughs> and the answer was? No. It's traditional. So now, yeah, Mary really wanted to go. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'm sorry, I can't come because I actually don't agree with having separate male, female things. And she, the mother was actually quite understanding. She said, look, if it wasn't my best friend who was running the shower, I'd agree with you. I hope my husband comes to the shower. So her feeling is I want men to be there too, but because of my best friend, who's a woman, I'm not allowed. Um, and so I said, okay, well, look, I'm not gonna come have a great shower. Then her sister emailed me quite angry with me mm. that I wasn't going to the shower. So can you see how much women mm. control of other women there was inherent in that little uh, interaction? Mm. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> it's interesting because I've been doing a um, big process um, on, on, angry, uh, on angry women and I realised um, the other day when I was little, I always had a pure desire that I wanted to be more than my mother. Like, not an, like I want to be more than her. Like, it, it was like a, an aspiration of wanting to be more. And I feel like the projection f that she felt was that was, who do you think you are? You're exactly like me. And this, who do you think you are, is a huge projection that I feel from angry women's spirits that I'm so scared to step out of the box and take risks because mm -hmm. I just go, oh, I, and I can't, I'm choosing still not to cry because I'm in so much fear of, of mm -hmm. the attack. Mm -hmm. But I know that um, I was getting a bit rebellious. Like, I'm going to do it anyway. Even if you're attacking me, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to have fun and I'm going <laughs> to force it. And, yeah. and to really just sit and feel the fear, it's um, I'm not there yet mm -hmm. to, to soften to the women. Yeah. So when we respond in anger to it, it, it doesn't help either. Like, it's a matter of feeling. The <laughs> First, it was go away, yeah. and now it was I don't care. You can be there, going to do it, but either yeah. way, it's not loving. No, no. Joy, you wanted to. Yeah. Um. Just a few, a few things are bubbling around. Like when Mary, when you said her excuse was it's traditional, that's just like a story. It's not the real reason because we're not. We're not in fact, I was thinking just before then when AJ was talking about the men. At least the men openly talk about them being under the thumb. With the women, it's more like, and I'm just feeling this, like it's um, it's unspoken almost. Mm. And because the there's no way you ever hear women to, um, actually saying, well, actually we're anti-men. And so it's almost like we've got beliefs that we've inherited that are buried deep within us that we're probably not even aware of that drive this behavior, mm. is that? Yeah, no, that's true. We, we, you do, and and these are a lot. A lot of them are multi generational injuries of a lot of terror. You know, mm. in the past, many women have been treated very, very badly, and as a result, there is a lot of terror multi generationally in women, uh, and and fear about how men are going to treat them, and and a very deep sensitivity to any form of, even a man running off and doing his own thing is a rejection, um, even when he's not rejecting you, mm. and. And so there's often there's a lot of beliefs in all of that. There's also um, the feeling in, in many women that uh, um, if if they break the mould, they're betraying every woman. Mm -hmm. And so um, and this is what many spirits in the women spirits in the spirit world are playing on uh, on earth as well. 
this fear that, that, that many women on earth have, that if they go and be a different kind of woman, mm-hmm. that, that, that all the other women will either be jealous of them mm-hmm. or afraid of them or angry with them, but never their friend. Mm-hmm. You know? So we have to desire to be a different woman, yes. to have different beliefs. Yes. If you, many of you um, have yet to really allow yourself to feel a celestial spirit who's a woman. Mm. Mm-hmm. The reason why is if, 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 a, if a celestial spirit who's a woman came and sat right in front of you right now, the majority of you would instantly either be in a rage with her or be bawling your eyes out. Mm-hmm. And the reason why you'd either be one of those two things is because the rage would come because you'd feel jealousy about her condition. Uh, or you'd be in so much grief about how different she feels than what you feel that you would automatically be crying. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every celestial spirit, male and female by the way, have that same effect on people on the earth generally. Either rage or grief, nothing in between. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, and you, you can see that you can see that's the general response that I get. It's either, <laughs> it's either rage or <laughs> grief and very little in between, right? <laughs> And that's, that. and that's because when a person sits before you who's completely open to all sorts of emotional experiences, completely unjudgmental about all of those experiences, but in harmony with truth, the only things you can feel is a feeling of either jealousy or competitiveness with the person and therefore anger, mm-hmm. or contrast of your own condition and straight into grief. Mm-hmm. But the only two things we generally go to. Matt? Um, I'm not sure if it's just me, but um, is, is there an emotion like a multi-generational thing with um, homosexual male souls that kind of side with the sisterhood emotion? Yes. Yeah, because like whenever you guys talk about the emotions with women that women have towards men, um, I'm like nodding my head. And yeah. this is many homosexual males have a lot of issues with their mothers because they generally yes. during childhood sided with their mothers because the homosexual male generally has a bit more softness in his soul towards the feminine mm-hmm. and therefore is going to feel a bit more of a in the unhealed condition feel a bit more attracted attraction to the mother rather than the father and the reality is it's an unhealed condition because when you're fully healed you will be masculine and have feelings of femininity in amongst that. And it's the very same for, um, for, for lesbian couples too, by the way. So, so the, key, the key if you're a, a lesbian couple is to, or a homosexual person you know, of, any, of any gender is to... Is to, is any, to anyone, either one. <laughs> is, to, is to stop separating yourself from the rest of society in mm. terms of injuries mm. and to start seeing that you, you, our injuries come from how we were brought up in every case, pretty much. And, uh, and as a result of that, we have some severe injuries, either from our mother or from our father or from both, mm-hmm. that we need to address. And we are not different. Our sexual orientation doesn't actually create any differences in that, with the exception that we have one additional injury often, and that is there is a deep condemnation in society for mm-hmm. homosexuality. Mm-hmm. And it is, a, it is a religious condemnation. There are many religions on the planet, Christianity, Buddhism, and other religions on the planet, um, the Muslim religion, and other major religions on the planet. So we're talking about the majority of mankind on the w- earth who have a religious format. So, which so, is pretty much everyone, which is, really. Which is pretty <laughs> much, yeah, everyone. Even but, in Australia, the least religious country in the world, there's still a lot of Christian themes in our yeah. society. Yeah. You know, like, yep. yeah. Now, if you think about it, this is why many homosexual people have a difficulty with God. It's not because of God. Mm. It's because of the religion's viewpoint of homosexuality that then causes the homosexual person to have a large degree of grief, which is often suppressed, uh, about how they now are getting treated by society and their own parents. Mm. And, and this affects their relationship with God or their beliefs about God. So, so my suggestion is to remember that 
while, yes, a homosexual person generally has exactly the same set of injuries as the average person, doesn't matter whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, you have mother and father based injuries that need to be worked through. But you have one additional injury by, given to you by society because of society's very terrible viewpoint of homosexuality, which is also religious in nature in almost all cases. In other words, they are telling you that you can never connect to God while you're a homosexual. Mm. Right? And so these two additional emotional injuries are the cause of much of your internal grief. Do you understand? Those two additional emotional injuries that the rest of the society doesn't have because the majority of society is heterosexual in nature. So, you know, a good 80 to 90% of people are heterosexual by, by naturally. And as a result of, the, of this and this terrible condemnation of homosexuality because of the fear of it, mankind has, has created two additional injuries for a homosexual individual in comparison to a heterosexual individual. But remember that all of the other injuries are pretty much identical to any other person that might have been brought up in the same situation with some little twists here and there because of the who you sided with when you grew up. Mm -hmm. You understand? So, it, yeah. for instance, in, in my, like in a, in a case similar to myself, if it was a heterosexual man who had sided with women, he might feel quite similar to me. Yes, very similar to you. Yeah. And in fact, you may even be attracted to him because he's feeling exactly the same as you, even yeah. though he's a heterosexual man. And if you think back at some of your attractions with heterosexual men, mm. you can see that many of them had the same feelings towards women that you had. Yeah, I'm going to have to do things. Does that make sense? Uh, if we, yes. Oh, Kenny, you want to ask? And then we'll come back to him. I, you mentioned to me some time ago that I have a fear of both men and women. Mm -hmm. Like, and that's anger in, in well, both genders. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm having very difficult trouble in addressing my fear towards both. And I don't know how to confront it. Kenny, in this discussion, I do not want to discuss oh. personal emotional issues. Mm -hmm. I was stating this thing to, to do with a general issue with homosexuality, not a specific issue necessarily with Matt. Does that make sense? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, because uh, we want to focus on why we're here tonight, which is this issue of helping dealing with some of our own stuff with regard to mediumship. And, and often these issues, these bigger issues, you see, for many people on the planet, and this is something we may need to understand, mm -hmm. We have our individual emotional issues. Now, our individual emotional issues we grew up with through our environment, and our environment was dominantly uh, our mother and father. Uh, and if we're without a father, then it's mother, and if it's without mother, then it's father, you know? But, but dominantly, it was our parents that brought us up, so therefore, they are the ones that have the major impact upon our emotional issues. However, there are some parts of society that have additional issues, to address, and there are some spirits in the spirit world because of this that have additional issues to address. And those additional issues are to do with the dominant belief of society imposed upon that group of people. So for example, a homosexual person has what I just mentioned, mm -hmm. this dominant, these two dominant things. Most homosexual persons have the injury, and this, this is also regarding our spirit friends who are homosexual. They have the injury of I can't connect to God if I'm homosexual because the religion condemns me if I'm homosexual. And there's, there's other in, the, the, the other injury of what was it, I can't remember what Just I said. General rejection. General rejection by society. society mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But if you look at, uh, historically, if you look at being a black man mm -hmm. in America, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah, particularly in the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, Just what would your, have been yeah. your additional emotional mm -hmm. injury? Can you see there's all this rejection every single day? Rejection, 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 rejection. You imagine if you're an Indian person and you're a part of the class of untouchables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every single day you're in a latrine or in a, in a, in a um, sewer cleaning out the sewer or the latrine for other people. You barely have enough to eat. Every single day it's like that. All your life it's like that. Like, so you're going to have an additional emotional injury imposed upon you by society's opinion or the religious belief. Mm -hmm. and, and the injuries that a homosexual carries is no different to the injury that that 
untouchable man, if I use the word untouchable in quotations, it, you know, in Indian society would feel because very similar rejections. There's this rejection. He, he's being rejected by society generally and he's also being told that he's not even worthy to connect to God either. Almost the same kind of rejection that a homosexual person is receiving by society. And, and we need to understand if we're going to help our spirit friends who are in, in dark places because of these projections, we need to come to understand that it's not... Uh, for many people, they've had far more emotional impositions upon them than we ourselves have had. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, we, we can be quite lucky that... Uh, in, we're, we're quite fortunate that uh, we haven't had some of them because some of them are terrible. Terrible impositions, and we need to learn to have compassion for all of those things. And that's the reason why I raise this issue. And um, what if there are some people on earth who can understand that, then we have the ability to help all of those spirits. Mm -hmm. So, so every spirit in the spirit world who's ever been treated race with racism, mm -hmm. every spirit in the spirit world who's ever been told that they're no good, that they're going to be a slave for the rest of their existence. Mm -hmm. Every spirit in the spirit world has had all sorts of other different problems, including things like Down syndrome and autism and other things that have not been recognised historically. Many of them have been put in asylums for all of their life. But never honoured, never respected, never considered. These people are going to have additional things that we need to help them with. And so the only way that we can really help them is by connecting them. <coughs> to their experience and understanding it and then we have an ability to help. So if an angry homosexual male comes along and wants to speak with you, he's not going to get much help if all we're going to do is condemn him or impose our religious beliefs upon him or do anything else with him, you know, or criticise him because he hasn't dealt with his mum stuff yet. Like, and, and why can't you connect to God? God's just there. Like, what's the problem? You know, like if we have all this sort of... Um, condescending viewpoints mm -hmm. towards him, then we have no hope of helping him. Is that to be open to him? Sorry? To be open to, to be open to him. To listen. Yeah. And, and you know, you, Kenny, are uh, a, a member of a, a group of people who have been criticised constantly for their height. Mm. And you know how bad that is. Many people in this group still condescend to you. And, and one reason why they still condescend to you is because they feel this neediness you have and then they get real condescending about it. Mm -hmm. Many of you, when you think of Kenny, this is how you feel. You feel condescending towards Kenny and you feel like, like you know, that he doesn't deserve your time because he's so needy, right? Not understanding the life he's had. He's, ha he's had quite a bad life in comparison to many of you because of this issue, right? And being put down a lot of his life, ignored a lot of his life, because of that issue. You see, if we love our brothers and sisters, we will start seeing those things. Instead of going, oh, Kenny, you're like, I'm tired of dealing with Kenny. He's just so needy all the time. Like, it's it's like exhausting, you know? Instead of doing that, you would have compassion with Kenny and you'd want to know why that he's so needy. And you'd want to say, Kenny, but you're a nice person. Like, what's going on with this neediness? And every time Kenny's needy with you, you'd go, Kenny, you're being needy with me again. Just to help him to understand what he's doing. Do you see? Yeah, but you, you see. but you wouldn't, you wouldn't condemn him for it. And it's the same with our spirit friends, and it's the same with society generally. We would, we we wouldn't, we'd have a lot more love, <coughs> rather than the condemnation. Yes, thanks. 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 Yeah, you just touched on it then, because I felt like um, I'm a heterosexual person. I'm a non-marginalised group mainly. Yep. But I found that. Um, because I had, I was carrying a lot of beliefs about homosexuality, and um, when I became friends on the path with people who, who are homosexual, I found I had a lot of repentance to do mm -hmm. to some to change some of those beliefs. And it's the same is true, is it not, for all of those marginalised groups? Yes. So we're all holding those beliefs. So. Yes. The whole reason why they're marginalised yeah. and for yes, terrible is because society generally, all of us people who are mm. normal, yeah. you know, who well, think we're yeah. normal, think we're normal. Know, <laughs> and we have marginalised the people who are yeah. not normal not, yeah, and, and therefore all of us have played a part mm. in the rejection. Mm. And of, still are. And still are, mm. unless we work through it emotionally. Mm. 
And this is all part and parcel of our work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. If we're going to become good mediums, mm -hmm. you can, can you see how the work we do on ourselves is of primary importance? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know we can keep going from for ages, but I feel we've sort of covered what we wanted to talk about. It's now half past ten. Mm -hmm. uh, so time went past pretty rapidly there. Some of you might have numbered bottoms by now, though. <laughs> and, uh, and sorry about that. Um, We'd like you to consider what we've said tonight and, and try to put some of that into practice in your personal lives. If you do, you'll find that the times you get together with the mediumship nights are going to be far more enjoyable. And also, you'll learn a lot more by the process of experimenting. And if, you could just, if we could just encourage you to, to really feel that you would like to develop, to become more loving with how we treat each other. You know, to, to be more loving how we treat each other and to notice when we're not. To make a commitment internally to yeah. notice when we're not. Yeah. To notice when we're trying to justify our anger and, you know, all those kind of things. Yeah. Often when we get angry about what gets uncovered when we start on this path, we might find this path because we have some desire to grow in love and to love humanity or even serve humanity. And then often when we're confronted with the truth about what's inside of us or the universe even, um, I notice a lot of people can get stuck in anger and, and quickly lose sight of the reason why they were drawn to the past in the first place. So um, I just, I guess I want to mirror your sentiments about humility. You know, if you can just be humble to those, to those things and recall your desire, the, those pure desires that are within you, and, and have faith that if you honour those desires, like if you have faith in yourself and God that you can actually live in those desires and through that process you'll become humble. You will become humble if you really want those things. And also yeah. I feel too develop faith in God that you can change. Yeah. So Some of us yeah. feel quite disillusioned about change. Do you know what I mean? We feel... Mm -hmm. We, we look back on our life and often we haven't changed very much sometimes through our life. And even now, you know, we're plugging away, you know, looking at things, but, but sometimes not much change happens. And we need to at least have some faith that we can change before we will actually change. And, uh, and it's important to try to, to hold on to this faith. There are many influences around you, both on earth and in the spirit world, which would love to cause you to believe that you can't change, that, that you're consigned to your current condition, current life and current happiness or level of unhappiness, depending on how you feel it to be, um, for the rest of your existence. And, there, and unfortunately, many spirits, because of this, many spirits who are in the hells of the spirit world or earthbound on the earth because they don't want to go to the spirit world because they believe they can't change for exactly the same reason. So if we can have some faith ourselves that we can change, then that faith that we have that we can change, when we talk to our spirit <coughs> friends, will make them feel like, yes, they have the ability to change too. And, and yeah. of course that's going to encourage them, <coughs> as you can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you act in faith that you can change, the more you really act on these principles that we talk about, the more the faith, your faith will grow as well. Because you see it start to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Just so, our spirit friends keep giving me this picture of the bonfire, of them all standing around the bonfire. So, yeah. so obviously a big uh, desire for them. So we would like to thank you guys for your time over the last uh, couple of weeks. So we know that your time's precious. And for your donations that we've received over the last few weeks so that that will help us live a bit longer <laughs> so thank you very much for that and uh, we'd just like to encourage you in closing to just to just practice love with each other L like view it as an experiment mm -hmm. practice love with each other rather than just talking about love and acting out of harmony with it did you see if we can start really practicing love with each other, noticing when we're unloving and going, yes, I need to address this issue, and it's urgent for me to address this issue. Many of you feel 
a lack of urgency to address the unloving issues. You, we, we often have conversations where people say, now you're expecting me to become more loving. <laughs> and I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course, that's why I thought we were here, right? <laughs> and, and when I say expecting, I, I don't expect anyone because we're loving, but, but obviously we're here because we want to learn more about love. So, so, so when we say, when we almost justify ourselves being in the unloving condition, well, often I receive emails from people saying, you know, you want me to be more advanced than I am. And I say, I write back to them, well, God wants you to be perfect, actually. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you want to be more advanced than you currently are? I don't understand. Like, what's the problem, you know? And, uh, and so we need to understand that we all have, and we want to inspire you with probably this last thought, we, we all have the ability to be perfect. God created you with the ability to become perfect. If you receive divine love and you connect with God and you work through issues of humility and truth, you will become perfect, actually. And, and so don't, don't accept imperfection. You see, many of us accept imperfection. We, we sort of almost justify imperfection. We say, oh, yeah, but, you know, like one email I got this week said, you know, he said to me, you know, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> That's why I'm projecting anger at you. Oh. I'm a work in progress. How can you expect me to be any different? You're a work in progress too. Wow. And you know what I wrote back? I said the difference between myself and yourself is I never justify mm. inside of myself an angry projection at another mm. person just because I'm a work in progress. Mm. Right? And so, if you can remember that your father desires you to be as he created you to be. He has the knowledge that you can be. Yeah, and he has the knowledge, yes, that you can be that thing. And often, we don't even believe we can be when we start this, right? When we start this process. But remember and have faith that God don't only creates perfect things. <laughs> and all we need to do is allow God to help recreate us or rebirth us mm -hmm. into becoming the perfect thing and don't put up with when I say put up don't don't accept or justify within yourself the imperfection mm -hmm. so you do need to allow it in the sense that you do need to know that you have it and you do need to stop condemning yourself for having it and you do need to love yourself even though you have it so I'm not suggesting to not do any of those things, but what I am saying is that don't go and justify the fact that you have it. Mm. Like say I'm doing my best. And I'm say, I'm doing sure. my best. You've all got to put up with me. Because <laughs> <laughs> right? the reality is that none of us should ever have to put up with another person being unloving. Mm. And the fact that we do is a gift that we give to the other so, you know, so if, if I'm unloving and Mary still loves me, she's giving me a gift mm -hmm. of her love. Mm -hmm. And if I love, I'll, I'll desire to do that as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, but if, she, if I justify, I'm, I'm a work in progress, that's why I punched her in the nose. Can you see mm -hmm. that I'm now justifying staying mm -hmm. in an I'm unloving condition, mm -hmm. which is a very unloving thing to do, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to just uh, uh, ask you to think about that. Just yeah. allow yourselves to consider what you might look like when you're perfect. <laughs> and actually hold on to that in your imagination. That's what you're working towards. What do you feel, think about and feel about what that might feel like to be perfect. And what it might feel like to interact with other people. And what it might feel like to be at one with God. You might not know what it's like, just, just imagine what it might feel like and hold on to the faith of obtaining that condition mm -hmm. and then whenever something unloving happens within you instead of condemning it or anything else you 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 notice it at least and you go this is not perfect and you go okay so what am i going to do about that that book yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it goes in the book too and and sometimes the book can be quite challenging right but but at least you are now noticing things and allowing yourself to develop in love now and you have a chance of change when you do that 
if you justify the imperfection, can you see that there's not much chance from changing from that state? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So we'd like to leave you with that. And uh, thanks for having us. Thanks for yeah, having yeah. us for the week. Thanks for the guys having us for the week. Thank you. And and their fire, which uh, is getting yeah. warm tonight. It's yeah. been a bit warmer in here tonight than <laughs> other times. And we uh, we will be back in uh, I think it's in the, uh, the second half of June, uh, sometime that we'll be back. We haven't for we haven't firmed up the date at this point because we're still making arrangements. We, I think the tentative date's on the blog. Is it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, we, so we'll be back late, late June. We, we think next time we'll come back for a couple of weeks. Um, mm -hmm. So that way it, we won't be trying to compress so many things into a short amount of time. And uh, in between that time, we, we're going to be visiting Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, potentially Bathurst and uh, Albury, Wodonga as well, besides visiting home so, and, and visiting Brisbane. So, um, so we're hoping to visit quite a lot of people in that time over the next few months. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing over the next few months and I hope you enjoy what you're doing over the next few months mm -hmm. and embrace those passions and desires and, and because I, I just feel that if all of us do that, uh, we have a great, a great ability to change everything around us. Mm -hmm. Not just our own life, but lots of, lo touch lots and lots of people's lives. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. So we'd like to, uh, to encourage you to do those things and to just have a think about the, our, what our spirit friends have shared with you tonight mm -hmm. with regard to the mediumship team as well. Yeah. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So have fun, everyone. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Pleasure? It's a pleasure. Thank you.